Hey, I, I meant to ask you something last episode, Kieran. Yeah, what was that? How was your um, centerfold? I mean, your, your cover of, of Australian Photography Magazine. <laughs> uh, yeah, my cover. Uh, yeah, pretty good. I was really happy with the, getting the cover photo for Australian Photography Magazine. It's a magazine that I've, sus- I've been a subscriber to for a couple of years now. So to get on the cover is a, I don't know, a pretty big honor for me. Okay. Do, do you ever remember, you know, maybe like any of your men's magazines and stuff when you were a kid and like, you know, the centerfold was always, you know, the thing? Uh, I don't ever recall having those kind of magazines, ah. but... Okay. All right. All right. Well, I, I reckon that photography magazines should bring bring on the centerfold, you know, where, you know, any, anyone can get on the cover, mate. Like, Well, if you're looking for the, the centerfold version of... The Australian Photography Magazine. You're probably looking at the the articles that they have inside, and there's a couple of good articles in this December edition, which is from Luke Charkey and Dylan Fox as well. There's a couple of good landscape articles there for you to read. But you've got to read them. Like <laughs> there's there's not enough pictures, you know, just uh, just a picture. There's some pretty pictures there to look at as well. All right, I'll, I'll have a look at them. I'll check them out. Excellent. Cool. Uh, so we've. <laughs> Again, of course, <laughs> have a, a, a prize on offer for our, our social media followers over the next two weeks. Yes, we do. Our friends at F Stoppers have got on board again and are offering our listeners a tutorial of their choice. Cool. I'd like this would definitely be a good Christmas present for somebody. I think um, this will also be a, a great little tutorial and something for somebody to set their own little task of improving their photography over their Christmas break, possibly. So, uh, much the same way as we've always done. Let's let's go uh, an image on our um, hashtag. Uh, also mentioning Project Rawcast or at Project Rawcast in your captions. Now we're going to run this one until 18th of December 2016 at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Uh, so we've got some phenomenal images on our hashtag and they keep rolling in. So hopefully uh, we can see some more over the next couple of weeks. It can be our little Christmas present to our listeners, a nice uh, tutorial from F Stoppers to one lucky listener. Definitely. Look, if you haven't checked out F-Stoppers, fstoppers.com, they have some of the best tutorials you will find anywhere online. Um, the, the quality of these tutorials are amazing. The production value is, is phenomenal. They, they literally travel the world um, for these tutorials and anywhere from 13 to 15 to 16 hours for some of them. So this this prize is valued at US $299. You'll have your choice of tutorial uh, for, this, for this prize. So whatever photography style suits you best, you can take away your own tutorial and hopefully go and learn something new. So. Yeah, it doesn't have to be landscape. It can be portraits, uh, architecture. doesn't have to be Photoshop as well. It can be Lightroom. Any tutorial you're after, they should have something there that should tickle your fancy. Awesome. And a massive thank you again, as always, to Nisi Filters um, for supporting us long term. Now, Nisi Filters are offering... A continuation of the 5% off to any Project Rawcast listeners. So any purchases of any value through the nisifilters.com.au website, uh, 5% off using our coupon code Project Rawcast or one word um, during the, the checkout process. Uh, so make use of that. And Christmas time coming up, buy yourself something new, buy yourself a nice set of filters or, or something to, to go along with the camera. Uh, maybe, you know, take them home and wrap them up for yourself and tell your wife you bought them later. Or your husband, you bought them later? Yeah, or well, you could yeah, buy them for that special photographer in your life. Go out there, buy some Nissi filters. Yeah, definitely. So, look, yeah, just just check out nissifilters.com.au for that. And massive thank you again to Nissi, as always, for, for the support. Um, now, Kieran, I've got another question for you. For me? Really? Okay. Yes, for you. Now, when you created the image for the cover of Australian Photography Magazine, did you think about the hyperfocal distance when you were focusing in that image? Well, this is actually a question I get asked quite a lot and having, relating to just the sharpness of my images and the detail and how I go about focusing my shots. And I do get asked about whether I use a hyperfocal distance, whether I calculate it at all. And it's really something I don't even think about. And I know it's meant to maximize or optimize your um, your depth of field when you're focusing. But in most cases, especially with a 
quite a closed aperture, it's not something that you really need to worry about. And so, so in that, to answer your question, no, I didn't worry about the hyperfocal distance when shooting that I, shot. I feel like I have a big part of that image. So you and I were actually at Hopeton Falls together when we took that, and we wouldn't have been there at that time of the day if I wasn't there, of course. So, I mean, mate, I just saw you set up your tripod and just randomly start snapping away. Like, all of a sudden, you've got a cover on, on Australian Photography Magazine. So you didn't think about the technical elements of shooting that? You just started randomly pressing your shutter button? Well, I mean, if you take thousands and thousands of photos, you're trying to get one, right? <laughs> Eventually, you're going to get one. So, so for anybody listening, the hyperfocal distance is one of these kind of technical things that some photographers think is a hugely important thing. I actually personally do use it quite often. So um, the hy- technically, what we're talking about here is focusing your camera at a certain point in your image and from that point halfway back to the front of that image all the way to infinity will uh, be sharp within your image so so technically focusing your camera at the hyperfocal distance ensures maximum sharpness from half this distance all the way to infinity so this is something i like i've been thinking recently and i've actually been trying my very hardest <laughs> to shoot like this to try to try and work and it's worked really well for me actually i i've personally think that it works um i don't know you might tell me different but well i mean for me I, this is just some numbers that um it probably doesn't need to you don't need to think about it too much but um just working at a depth of field calculator for a hyperfocal distance for a full frame camera like a canon 5d um if i'm setting an aperture of say f8 which is what i'm i'd usually do at first like a starting point when shooting a landscape image if I'm using my wide angle lens, so 16 millimeters, if I want to focus just two meters in front of me, so that's not very far in front, that's going to give me a depth of field of less than a meter from the camera up until infinity. So that's a quite a big or a large depth of field when just focusing fairly close in front of me. And it's not something that I really need to think about too much. I just sort of realize, okay, I'll focus somewhere in my foreground. So at least what's close to the camera is in focus. And then I'll have, I should have a decent focus up until right at the back of the image. So up until infinity. Yep. So like for me, hyperfocal is kind of more important when there's a lot of depth in an image. So when it's a long way from beginning to back. So if you're shooting a really flat scene, a wall or even a waterfall, which is quite close to you, probably not so important. But but if you're shooting from the top of a mountain and your horizon's like hundreds of kilometers away and you kind of want to get the whole image or whole scene in focus, I, I find it's more important then than, than probably shooting something up close. Yeah, it, one thing I also do for focus, which uh, it's not on every camera, um, but some cameras do also have a depth of field preview button. And I found this to be very, very helpful uh, when shooting either from live view, so shooting from the back of the camera or even uh, looking through the viewfinder, is using the depth of field preview button, which will actually step down the lens to the aperture you have selected. So normally when you're looking through a viewfinder or the live view, it has the aperture open as wide as it can be. And using the depth of field preview button, we'll step it down to say F8 if you are if you have that selected. And you'll be able to check your focus from uh, right in your foreground, right up to your background and see whether everything is nice and sharp and in focus before taking the shot. Yep, cool. It all sounds really calculated. Oh, sorry, calculated? Complex. I press the depth of field button, everything goes black, and I'm just like, well, I, I won't press that again because um, I don't want my picture to be black. Probably need to stop shooting at F22 then. <laughs> Is that all? That's, that's what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> When it's at F8, it, it will darken the image slightly because it is letting less light into the camera. But if you do have plenty of light, if you're shooting um, before sunset or even in the middle of the day, then it's not going to make a huge difference to what the scene looks like through the camera. But if you do have it at set, have it set to f twenty two, then it is going to darken the image considerably. 
Yeah, cool. All right, well, we'll put up some links on our projectrawcast.com website to Hyperfocal. Now, I've, I've in the past used an app for this, so PhotoPills as an app. Um, I find it quite handy. I mean, I think it cost me about $15 and the, the amount of information in this app is pretty crazy. All sorts of cool things like planning your scenes or planning when to be at a spot for sunrise or sunset through to when to shoot the Milky Way, all that sort of stuff, but hyperfocal distance and those sort of things are all contained within this app and, and probably an easy way to really calculate things. But it doesn't, I guess the main thing to think about with your focus is as long as what you want to be in focus is in focus, then if other little areas of the image are a bit soft, it shouldn't make too much of a difference. But if you are going for that maximum depth of field and really wanting everything to be pin sharp, then maybe consider just getting your head around the hyperfocal distance and how to calculate it. Yeah, I think like obviously the bigger your image is, the more impact this type of accuracy or or calculations will actually have as well. Probably not so important when you're looking at a picture that's 1080 pixels wide on Instagram or 2000 pixels wide on Facebook, whatever whatever it is. Um, If you're printing larger images where um, things like this can really kind of show up. I think it's probably a bit more important to think about that sort of thing then. I think we we'll probably should just have a brief mention of focus stacking and that it is a thing out there that you can do, taking multiple images of uh, with your focus point at different spots and then merging them all in post-production later. But that's another step and a bit more complicated. Yeah, you just gave me a headache. Sorry. It's <laughs> too much to think about, man. I just want to press my shutter button yeah yeah i like it's good to get it right in just one exposure <laughs> yeah definitely cool so we'll, we'll, we'll put up some links to that um uh, yeah uh, mate my head's spinning already just thinking about it so i can imagine how s- some people who will be listening will be thinking the same thing as well so it's photography not maths uh, oh man <laughs> <laughs> cool hey i've i'm another thing that i, I would like to know is how how important do you think captions are on your social media posts? I guess I think they're important for the people who actually read captions and they're not important for those that just go through and double tap each image or just click like or just look at the picture and scroll on. How, how about you? I mean, do you spend it? I know just from reading your captions, you tend to add quite a long story and a bit of information about the shot that you've taken and it seems to you that you do put a lot of focus and attention into your captions. So how important do you think they are? Very, I personally think very important. So I think the picture for me is only part of the story. Um, The picture for me would be a way to grab people's attention in the first place and the captions are a way to keep people there long term and keep them coming back so i mean you know taking a photo is one thing but the adventure or the story of how you got to that photo or how you process that photo or or something about that photo or about that image is really important Um, so i'm a firm believer that captions keep people there and obviously deliver the story behind that behind the images that you're creating um i i'm massive massive believer in in telling a story and trying to really give people a bit of an insight into what they're looking at i've kind of um definitely like to spend a bit of time on the stories because it's it also allows people to kind of connect with me personally as well definitely no with your shots as well adding that little bit of information about what the camera settings were for the shots does keep people coming back to your images and wanting to read your captions so they can get a a bit of, as you say, a bit more information about the story of the shot and how it was taken. And it is a good way that people can see an image and maybe even learn a bit from it as well. Definitely. And just putting the camera settings on a picture for me is is generated a lot of conversation over the time that I've I've been posting, particularly to Instagram. it, it's uh, so many people say thank you thank you so much for giving me an insight into this and I think sometimes too for, I kind of got to think of who you're shooting for or who you're posting for you know if you're kind of looking to impress the general photography community and your peers as photographers then the story probably doesn't really matter because all they're looking at this is the technical elements of your photo and they're like well they're going to judge you on that um, whereas the average person and, and people who aren't necessarily as technically minded in photography probably 
can engage with the story just as much as they engage with the photo. Like seeing seeing a great photo is is one thing, but then kind of giving a bit of an insight into that particular photo or how you've shot it or whatever whatever it is that you're telling in your story i do both i like to tell the story about how i got there or who i'm with or what i'm there for plus also delivering some information about how that image was created um and it it, then it kind of appeals to a lot of people whereas you know yourself as a photographer you probably look at an image first and foremost and will look at it and go yeah mate you're so overexposed overexposed shy sky um (laughs) it's got dust spots on it (laughs) whereas whereas my partner would look at the photo and go, wow, I want to go there, you know, no matter, you know, how blurry it is or how much of an Orton effect you put on it, how long the exposure is, how awesomely you've saturated your mid-tones as compared to your highlights. The pe- different people see different things within an image and I think the caption kind of helps people, you know, to broaden the appeal around an image as well. I suppose it does matter if, you, if you're putting in a, good quality image as well as a story as well as technical information you're catering for a much broader audience as well and so you are going to get a broader range of engagement from different people and it i guess it also depends on what you are shooting and what your style of photography is so if you are shooting uh, travel or lifestyle shots then a story is a lot more important than if you were shooting just basically landscape shots Definitely. I think social media becomes such a massively, or massively, such a big part of people's lives that um, when you start to generate an audience, the people who are following you become part of your life. And in many ways, I think that story allows people to connect with you long term and, and follow your ride or follow your story and follow your life, how it evolves or follow the adventures that you go on. Um, so in, in terms of the... I, I get so many comments around the story um, that I, I just wouldn't have expected, you know, when I first started, I suppose, to to really care about Instagram as compared to the quality of the image. Um, there's so many, there's just such a diverse range of people that could potentially see your images um, that appealing to everybody and taking the taking some people along for the ride with you from every post. Each post is a new part of your life, a new part of your story, a new adventure. Telling that and telling people how you you feel emotionally behind that as well. It's, it's um, sometimes I think showing a bit of weakness is also a great way to allow people to connect with you because we're all human. We're not, you know, super human. I think when you're a little bit younger, you might think you are. Um, but I think as you grow a little bit older and maybe a little bit more wiser, you, you learn that those types of things kind of allow people to really become part of your life as well, you know, and relate to you. And if you do see some of the really popular Instagram accounts, they are like they may not be great photos or anything, but people connect with it because they can live vicariously through someone else's Instagram accounts and see the the lifestyle of someone who may be a bit rich and famous and doing all these cool things. And it, if there's a story behind it, it does give those people a way to. Uh, escape from their own lives for a couple of minutes even don't have to be living a bad life but it is just nice to see what other people are up to and have that same escapism that you get from reading a book or watching a reality tv show and it's just tiny little bits that add up over the course of an entire year of someone's instagram posts definitely i think yeah if, um, <laughs> you you Almost, I don't know how many people that I've met through Instagram or through some form of social media now where you almost feel like you know them because you followed along with their story. You, you, you kind of feel like you've been part of their life and it's not hard to pick up a conversation with somebody. Uh, I've, t- I've done this literally every, everywhere that I've been when I, I meet new people that I've previously already engaged with it's like it's not hard to strike up a conversation because you've you already know something about them or they already know something about you and you, you can almost it almost feels like you're just picking up the conversation with them quite often you know yeah definitely i i like seeing original and unique captions on my on people's social feeds as well if it's the same caption three or four times in a row it means that people are just for me it's just taking that little bit of time and care to make people connect with the image, um, you know, see, seeing people post three or four images in a day and it's the exact same caption all the time. That's obviously their own personal choice. That's cool. But I think 
if you want to grow your social media brand and social media profile, putting a bit of time and effort into that and making sure that people do connect with you is is really a big part of it. And I think it, oh, from my own experience, sometimes I, I know that a story is important and I, I should write something, but it it can be a bit difficult to try and find or try and find the words that relate to the image that you're posting and how it's going to relate to everyone else that's going to read it. And sometimes I just, I don't know, I, I struggle to find the words to write down. So my caption may not be very long. It may not have a, a complete story. And then I also need to think, okay, well, my Instagram is there to get exposure for my photography business. And I also need to say any particular uh, products or services that I've got. So, But I don't want to put that on every post because I don't want people just to see, oh, it's just selling something over and over again. So I, yeah. I'd struggle yeah. between finding that balance between story and getting a message of my business out there as well. So it can be a bit difficult at times and it is something that if you are using Instagram for a business uh, to think about a bit more and maybe plan your posts a bit better beforehand rather than just jumping in and thinking then and there, okay, what can I write for this? Yeah, definitely. I think the thing there is kind of addressing right from the very beginning what your social media profile is there for, if it's there for a business or if it's there for person or if it's there for a mixed um, use. I think there are easy ways to sell a business message without putting the hard sell on all the time. I'd probably not something I really want to touch on now, um, but there are great ways of, of doing that and making sure that you are still using it for a business purpose to drive potential sales, clients, whatever it is that you're doing without necessarily putting the hard sell on, on every single post. I think just brand awareness and putting yourself in people's mind in the right way does that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a conversation for another day, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably talk to you about it afterwards and just yeah, pick your brain and see what all the things that I'm doing wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm happily tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, sweet. So, original captions. Yes. I guess we'd mainly talk about Instagram because it is heavily related to photography these days. But a, a question I have for you is related to Facebook as well because people kind of look down on Facebook a bit because it is a, a necessary evil but now you do have to really pay to get your message out there so do you have any tips on how people can optimize their Facebook marketing for their business or photography business? Yeah, I think I've got some tips here. First and foremost, I think what people need to remember about Facebook now is that it is a marketing platform first and foremost. Um, Facebook don't necessarily make direct revenue from the fact you have a personal account. They make money off your personal information that you're feeding it by having a personal account and then allowing brands to tap into that particular um, demographical targeting, I suppose. Um, so Facebook is a marketing platform first and foremost. It is a shareholder driven business now. So Facebook need to squeeze revenue, as much revenue as they can out of it to keep their shareholders and company growth happy. Now, um, as a photographer, the Facebook is one of the quickest ways that I know of to gain exposure for your work because it's very, very easy to put up a post on Facebook and within a minute have a promoted post out running and as much as you're willing to pay is as much reach as you're going to have. Now, as a business page, so if you're, you're starting a business page for your photography, not a personal account, the two different things, uh, you automatically have a, a handicap placed on your reach. It's simple as that. I mean, there's algorithmic um, values that are placed on your content um, and how far that content reaches. And it's all about the amount of engagement that your post gets and how uh, how recently somebody has engaged with your content as well. So for me, first and foremost, it's very easy to get exposure on Facebook. I, I don't see it a lot within the photography community in Australia. I don't know whether it's maybe just that kind of fear behind people 
you know, being scared to go and put some money into marketing their business. I don't know what it is. There are some very successful photographers who use it very well, sell a lot of prints, travel full time, travel the world. And I see their posts day in, day out with a little sponsored uh, tag on it because they're, they're using it for that purpose. So, um, but it's, it's kind of important to, to experiment with if you do decide to promote your content, um, to, to have a look at the demographic that you're targeting. I mean, so for an image for you, Kieran, can you think of the type of person who would or who has been in the past likely to buy a print off you? Well, that's I guess it is difficult to try and determine that. And when you go into boosting a post and making a sponsored post, you've got so many def- demographic options of where people are, their age, um, male, female, uh, what their interests are. And you can try and think of all the different interests that people might have of wanting to buy your product. And I guess I've got a couple of different demographics that I'd aim for, people who want to buy prints or people who want to buy workshops or tutorials. But I guess for me, I I probably just blindly go through it and just chuck in a whole bunch of stuff and not know whether I'm adding too much or whether I'm not putting enough in to really uh, find my target market. It is hard to really work it out, and yeah, I I pretty much just do it blindly and hope for the best. <laughs> well, I, I could pretty much tell you straight away that I am not your target market. So if you were to to consider me as a photographer who is probably competing against you in some ways for for exposure to sell my prints, those sort of things. I am not the person that you should be targeting. So your peers in terms of other photographers are not the people, if you want to make money from your photography, that you should be targeting. You, you, you've got to think about the broader community of the type of person who, if you're going to sell a print, who's going to hang it up on their wall in their house, okay? Then you've got to think about how much you sell your prints for. Think about the um, how much people earn. Can they Can they afford a print to put on their wall? Do they own their home? Are they are they likely to do those sort of things? Uh, I tend to find for me and the success that I've had, and I do quite a lot of promoted posts on Facebook to, for two reasons. One is obviously to gain brand awareness or exposure for my Tassie Grammar brand. And two is to directly drive traffic to my website as well. So a lot of, so if I'm doing a blog post quite often, just about all the time. Quite, um, it'll have some sort of brand message where I might be doing some sort of campaign for a client or um, you know a tourism type project here that I, I would do. So me driving traffic directly towards that has twofold effect. One is gaining exposure for the client that I'm working for. And two is also directly driving traffic to my website, which is my sales and marketing platform for my photography outside of any other social media account. So you can buy the images directly from within my website. You can also, when you land on my website, view the other articles in my website. The more traffic that you can get to that central platform, the better off you're going to be long-term and the more opportunity you're opening up to, to generate revenue from that. Now I've had even recently where I, I go out on a job, I do a shoot for a client, Part of what I would do is I'll guarantee them a blog post on a website, whether it's mine, theirs, another platform that that we might use. And that has led on to other people contacting me for the same thing. So so the promoted post that I would say do $20 over two days, it's $10 a day. I might generate 2,000 unique visits to my website from that. That leads on to so much more. So it's almost an investment into traffic to your main money-making tool which would either be your website or potentially, I mean, you can promote posts on Instagram as well, um, you know, your Instagram account and profile as a whole. So there's so many benefits and potential opportunities if you are willing to invest money. I think there's a fear around being seen as not having organic growth on your photography brand. But if you run a business and you operate a commercial enterprise, you should be maximizing your potential to put your brand services and products in front of as many people as you possibly can. I was just thinking of ways that I know I've probably failed with my demographic is when I'm on my personal Facebook page and I see an ad for my business page and I'm thinking, what are you, what are you doing, Facebook? What are you spending my money on? You're sending it to me. I'm not going to use my services. And I just think if it's, it's showing it to me, then I've probably done something completely wrong. 
Yeah, I quite often see my own promoter posts in my feed. But like, so if I was to say be doing something Tasmania related and I was working with a, a business here in Tasmania, I'd be looking at targeting a demographic that would be their key market. So say, for example, maybe a helicopter company. So they're doing, um, you know, heli tours. So you've got to think about the value of the tour itself. So if somebody's hiring a helicopter for $965 an hour plus GST, that's $1,100 an hour. It's probably an older demographic that would potentially be willing to spend that much money. So it's almost, you know, I'd be looking at the 30 plus, 35 plus um, age group who may have a bit of spare cash on their holiday to throw around. I'm not going to say they're the only people that would do it, but if you are to maximize the potential to get exposure for that, I'd be targeting a slightly older demographic. I'd probably be targeting people who like Tasmania. Um, so who've got an interest in Tasmania, Facebook knows this. You don't even have to tell it you like Tasmania, but if you engage with content that's focused around Tasmania, it will learn that. So I'd be looking at that type of age group and who like travel, who potentially like photography, who like adventure travel, uh, who like tourism. Like I'd be looking at those types of demographics around those people. And, and there's so many, I, I, you've kind of got to think about who, and what purpose the content is being promoted for. Um, I certainly wouldn't be targeting your demographic or you as a person if I was looking to sell prints. I'd be looking maybe slightly older, I'm 40 plus, homeowner, $100,000 plus income, um, good job, those types of things. You know, like you kind of got to think about the reasoning behind or, or you know, what, what exactly you're trying to achieve, so... So you're also saying that for marketing, this is a, a time when stereotypes will probably, or knowing some stereotypes will probably work, unfortunately. No, definitely. And, and just got to remember that the whole point is to maximize the opportunity to get a sale or to get your brand in front of the right people. That's what marketing is. <laughs> so you, you need to just be thinking about exactly who it is you're targeting. Like I highly doubt if I was to be trying to push, say, a Christmas print sale to my website that a 16-year-old to 24-year-old demographic is going to work for me. I think I'd be wasting my money if I did that. You know, I'd be looking at reaching... Uh, a, a much a more mature demographic, an older demographic than that, 30 plus singles, no, sorry, not singles, definitely not singles, but couples, um, you know, people buying presents for somebody else, people who've got an interest in the particular area that you're, you know, you probably specialize in. A lot of my stuff's Tasmania. So um, I'll be looking at people who like Tasmania, who've traveled to Tasmania. Those types of things um, are definitely where I'd be going, you know. I, I, and f Facebook for me is the most accurate and the single best way to reach a specific demographic on any marketing platform that I've ever seen. There is it is incredible of how closely you can pinpoint the exact type of person you want. And obviously niche marketing or, or, or hitting the right type of audience is a great way to improve your your overall um, conversion rates on sales. So. so how long would you spend on working out the demographic for a particular post? Do you go through and uh, specify really specific locations? Do you do something broad like just Tasmania or even for interests, would you do, uh, say, less than 10 interests, more than 20? It, it, it depends on what I'm trying to achieve from that post as well. So um, thinking about, say, if I was promoting somebody else's business, I've got to kind of target their market, if you like. I have a talk to a business owner when I'm doing a campaign for them and I say, what is your target market? You know, who is likely to buy your product? Who's likely to stay at your accommodation property? Who's likely to take your tour? Who is it that's most likely in their mind that would be likely to spend money for their business? Whereas with my, my stuff, I've kind of refined it a lot and it's taken a lot of experimentation over time to, to really kind of tailor. I've got maybe 27 or 28 different audiences that I would look at within, that I've saved, say, in the back of Facebook, um, different international markets, different age groups, different demographics, and, and absolutely different income values as well, depending on what I'm trying to achieve with those posts. I do the same thing with my marketing clients as well. It's it's really about kind of trying to understand their business. So it's, it's hard to give an exact statement of that because they vary so much depending on what exactly it is you're trying to promote. But as a photographer, 
my key thing would be looking at ensuring you're maximizing the potential of somebody who's most likely to actually want to spend money on your prints. If your market is other photographers, you're doing the wrong thing straight away. Homeowners who've got a bit of spare cash, that's probably more likely to get you sales than, than really trying to impress your peers and targeting you know, somebody who loves digital cameras or somebody who loves digital photography, which are two exact demographics within Facebook that you can target. They're not the people you want to like your stuff. It's it's a much broader range of the average person who, who's going to look at your print and go, wow, I want that hanging on my wall. Well, after all that information, I'm expecting my print sales to go through the roof after my next Facebook promoted post or cool. at, <laughs> at least improve it slightly. Cool. I only charge 10% commission for my advice as well. So. <laughs> uh, just put it on my tab. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, that's, look, if, if anybody would like some more tips on that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of answer them. I mean, just contact us at hello at projectwalkhouse.com via email and we definitely like, definitely have a look at that. And um, But yeah, I mean, I if you run a business, I personally feel don't be scared to invest a bit of money to reach an audience. It, the only person you're impacting on is yourself if you're not maximizing your opportunity to get your products and services. And as a photographer, that's either photography as a commercial opportunity where you are a wedding photographer or as a landscape photographer, it could be that you're selling prints or even as a travel influencer, it's traffic to your website. If, if you've got the opportunity to do it, you, you are maximizing your ability to get an audience for your images or your words. Um, don't be scared to use it because the businesses that do are very successful if they get this right. I mean, I've got a couple of views just on the, the marketing through social media and with Facebook um, running through Instagram now as well. I, I tend to think about the posts, uh, the sponsored posts that I do, and I think I don't want to see advertising on Instagram. So I'm not going to put my ads on Instagram because I feel that have a negative effect on my business. And at the same time, when I'm looking through Facebook, I completely ignore anything that's on that right column. So I think other people are going to ignore that. So I disregard that right column as well. So the only time I'll, the only placement I put of my ads is usually in the main feed just because of my own preferences and what I think I would be uh, what I would see and want to go visit. Yeah, I, th- I think at the moment too, there's probably a little bit of a, a negativity around people believing other people are going to hate them if they start marketing on Instagram or, or using Instagram for paid posts or promoter posts. Just this morning, I saw a very successful um, photographer up on the north coast of New South Wales um, sells a lot of prints. He's actually one of the guys that I see quite a lot on Facebook who uses Facebook successfully. Um, first time I'd ever seen it. He appeared in my Instagram feed as a promoted post this morning, promoting his tours and his photo tours. To some people, you'd look at that and go, "Mate, you know what are you doing? Don't don't get in my feed. Uh, uh, stay away from me." I looked at it and thought, you know what? Good on you, mate. Fin- finally, some some other guys within the local photography community have tapped in or, or started to see the fact that reaching a bigger audience for their brand message is going to generate them long-term success um, if they do it right, of course. I, I actually think <laughs> knowing and, and being on that business side of it that um, promoted posts – some people don't like them that's great but they're not your target market let them shut off let them let them turn off the ads that's fine that then they're not your target market to begin with you will reach the right audience by doing that um and obviously your peers in the photography world probably aren't the right audience it's the people who for this person uh, runs workshops and photo tours would like the average photographer who doesn't know how to use the camera, who wants to go to some great locations, knows his name. He's a great photographer. Gee, I've just seen a brand message from this guy. I'll go and connect with him, potentially go and book a tour. I think good on him. Um, and why not? If, if that's a tool for business, do it. It is It is getting to that point though, I think, because I, I have done a promoted post through Instagram just to see how to go. And I did end up seeing it come up in my own feed and I was thinking, oh God, what have I done? But at the same time, I have seen other promoted posts from other photographers I know. 
and it's gotten to that point where I think, well, it's I'm I'm really sort of just fighting the inevitable here, and I probably should just jump on board with everyone else and just promote my posts through Instagram as well. Well, six months to 12 months from now, we won't even need to be having this conversation because it'll be a normal part of the business, you know? Yeah, um, no. Instagram's, it's Instagram's squeezing your organic reach to begin with right now. And if you can target a very specific type of person who's going to take a photo tour, say, on the Great Ocean Road from the 27th to the, tw- to the 30th of January next year, why not? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my personal opinion. Um, and, and I say good on the people who are willing to go out and grab those opportunities. The haters out there who, who see that, that they're not your target market. They don't want to do it. That's fine. That's their own business. But you don't own Instagram. You don't own Facebook. If promoted posts start appearing in there, too bad. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is just, you got to move forward. These are marketing platforms and anybody with a smart uh, business mind is going to go and use them. So, All right, fine. I'll, I'll stop being a little whinge and I'll, <laughs> I'll might, I might start marketing on Instagram. Cool. So as I said, ten percent, ten percent commission. So, and if you're a, if you're a listener out there, um, and you see a, an ad for one of my for print sales on Instagram, then let me know so I know that I'm not reaching my target audience there. So I think with our <laughs> audience on our podcast being mostly photographers, they probably won't want to buy my prints. No, definitely, and that's 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 pretty much what it is. Just you know, try to reach the right people, and you'll you'll succeed from doing that. So. Speaking of listeners, do we have any listener questions? We do. We do this week. Um, I, I feel that was a trick question. Really? The, the listener question? Yeah, you, you knew that we had a list. That you knew yeah, we had so a listener so question. Know. You were just trying to trick me. All right. So, look, we, we've got a, a really good question here uh, from, from Fernando. It's come through via email. Uh, so, hey, guys, loving the podcast. Quick question. For somebody who's just starting out and needing to buy equipment, what all-purpose lens would you recommend? Like you, I'm Canon all the way. Have an ATD. Cheap, but good, I think. I'm on a pretty tight budget, but still wanting quality. I was thinking the 24-70 to F4, but thought I'd get your advice. Also, needing filters that will fit in the tight budget, but have very little knowledge about them. Well, uh, I think this would echo a lot of people's thoughts just when going out and buying a lens or buying any kind of photography equipment when they're just starting out. They see the price tags and think, I can't afford any of the good stuff. What's something cheap but still is good? And I suppose there's like this with any photographer, they want to maximize the quality while minimizing costs. And there is so many different options out there. And how do you pick the right one and still be happy with what you've picked and not have, not think, ah, oh, I wish I'd gotten something else? So what would you recommend for an all-round lens for a Canon? Look, I'm a firm believer in the buy cheap, buy twice um, policy here. So if you can invest in better glass, it will last you far longer than going out and buying cheap glass. I mean... A good le- a good lens may be the single best investment you will ever make in your photography. So, I mean, it's great having whatever camera it is, but ultimately it's the glass itself that helps to get the light onto the sensor of the camera in the first place. So any of the Canon lenses in any of the F2.8 varieties, for me, if you can afford them, are fantastic. So the 24-70 F2.8, the 16-35 F2.8, there's a new Series 3 of that lens, which is reviewing incredibly well. Uh, The 70-200 F2.8, they're all great lenses. But taking a step back, and about $1,000 to $1,500 less per lens Each of those varieties of lenses have also got an F4 version. So the 24 to 70 F4, the 16 to 35 F4, and the 70 to 200 F4, they've all got a far cheaper version of that lens and the optics of them are just as good as the F2.8. The only difference being the wider aperture of F2.8 on the more expensive lenses means more glass, more moving parts in a lens. So the F4 variety of any of those lenses, in my opinion, are very much worth the money. Um, So if you're on a limited budget, the F4 of any of those lenses, the 24 to 70, I think is the better all purpose lens, 16 to 35, Definitely, if you're a purist landscape photographer, the 16 to 35 is going to be the go-to lens. But the 24 to 70 for a general walk-around handheld 
lens that you, you know, you can take traveling with you and snap whatever you want. But also, I suppose the 24 to 105, maybe as a travel lens, are the better version as well in the F4. So. And don't and don't rule out secondhand uh, lenses as well. I mean, make sure to check them out mate, and check that they're not scratched and uh, the optics are still good. But you can get fairly good um, deals on buying secondhand and also wait for any deals from camera stores uh, especially around christmas time it's going to be sales if you've got a lens in mind and you think ah i can't afford it just wait a few months or however long it's going to take to save up just a little more because as uh, tazzy grammar said if you buy the cheaper one too soon you'll end up regretting it later down the track when you're going to buy the the better lens anyway that's like, I just think if you're budget minded, I know, I know it's, you know, obviously you you've probably got so much that you can spend. That's cool. Everybody, everybody is in that position, particularly early on in their day of photography. If you're, if you're budget minded, it's almost, you've got to think, am I going to replace this lens a month or two months from now anyway? That, that, that means you're going to buy something twice and it almost goes against the whole grain of, you know, of just budgeting correctly in the first place. And a bit of a, if I would have had that advice when I first started photography, I would have saved so much money in the, the junk that I bought over the years, which quite simply just didn't deliver the results that I was hoping for and certainly didn't suit an upgrade path of, of new camera bodies. I've got, lenses now that I have had literally so my 16 to 35 mil lens I've had these these lenses now for years the 24 to 70 I've had them for years and they've far outlasted the camera bodies which I replace far more often um, so the lenses are an investment over time and I think um, getting something that's good to begin with will ultimately save you far far more money down the line than buying something just because of the price point yeah just keep an eye out for exactly what you want we'll put a couple of links up as well if you just want to check out different reviews and see how different lenses compare to each other but do your research have a little look around and if you do have something that your mind's kind of stuck on just wait a bit wait until you can save up a bit more or have a look at um, getting it secondhand but as an all-round lens, any, as uh, Tezogram said, the 24, 70 or 105 for Canon is, um, yeah, a great lens and not too expensive. Yep. I, and the second part of this question is about filters as well. Now, I am a firm believer of this exact thing with filters. Now, yes, we'll be open and transparent here. We have a, a commercial interest with Nisi. Um, so this is not, you know, not going to sway my actual recommendation in any way shape or form i have over the years used every single brand of filter that, that i've been able to get my hands on from Koken to hoya to lee uh i know you use high tech um i, I b and w i've i've i used to swear by them filters uh, are very much uh, you, you pay for what you get so the quality of optics on the better glass is more expensive for a reason it is far better in terms of quality um, filters for me are very much the same as lenses as well they're an investment so if you're going to buy cheap filters you will replace them eventually i mean you you'll get frustrated by them um, i've seen like variable nd filters Personally, I would never use them. It's just me. Um, I, I know some guys who do use them, nothing against it, but personally, I, I don't. Um, and it's just from experience of, of knowing full well that the glass and the optics really does make a massive difference. Right now, I personally use Nisi. For me, from what I have personally used and what I've tested over time and, and for many other photographers that I know and respect extremely well, at this current moment, they perform better than anything else I've ever seen or used. Um, that, that's just, that's my personal opinion from my experience. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you've got a limited budget, you've, you've kind of got to go, go with what you want. I mean, a polarizer for me is an absolute must. Um, and then I would use a six stop, a 10 stop and a, a 0.9 soft grad in those order probably of, of importance. Um, but look, I, I've, I'm just a firm believer that the quality of the glass makes a huge difference in the filters exactly the same way as it does with lenses. It's something that I notice when I see people first starting out with uh, cameras as well and lenses, they get 
Uh, for some reason, they get sold a, a cheap UV filter as well and get told that it'll protect the sensor and the, the lens itself. And it's such a, a weird thing to have this lens that could be worth a thousand or a couple of thousand dollars and then you put a $20 piece of glass on it. So anything you put on the front of your lens is going to be the first point where the light goes through. And if that quality of the glass is not up to scratch, then there's no point in having expensive stuff behind it. So again, going for uh, something that is better quality. So going for, um, say, the, the Nissi filters is going to be better than going for um, just screw-on ones or cheaper ones just for the sake of a budget because you're going, your, your photography is going to be sacrificed by going for, um, yeah, the, the cheaper glass. Definitely. I think that you've also got square filters and round filters or rectangle and square filters and round filters. I'm, I'm a firm believer, again, by using both systems for many years, that square filters give you the flexibility of being able to use them on multiple thread sizes if you just have the adapters for the, for the threads, whereas an expensive round filter, and I buy that at 82 mil, um, it's usable on an 82 mil lens unless you get a step down thing um, a step down thread which then actually has a negative impact on the um, image quality as well so for me square filters are definitely the way to go they give a far better investment over a long period of time for a bigger variety of lenses and equipment that you can use them with so um, i've got literally 20 30 odd round filters that i've used over the years that are all for different thread sizes polarizers six stops ten stops all sorts of different ones they sit there now doing nothing because my square filters are so much more flexible to use on a different variety of lenses all right fernando uh, hopefully we've answered your question there and given you some things to think about and help you make your choice on what lens and filters to get so uh, another bit of newsworthy stuff that's happened this week or in the last couple of weeks is um, a, a big personality in photography uh, in Kai Man Wong or Kai as many people would know him within Digital Rev it's produced for, for nearly seven years great videos <laughs> Quite a sarcastic, but also a very, very fun underlying tone to, to his um, videos that he's produced over the years for reviews. Has, has recently left Digital Revenue. He's, he's struck out on his own with his own YouTube channel. Um, I I remember when I first started looking at reviews of you know equipment and kind of looking at this stuff. I used to love looking at his. Um, videos and kind of watching him. I'd literally just queue them up and just watch them one after the other because he was actually quite entertaining as well. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's actually gone to start his own YouTube channel and I, I really hope that he continues and actually succeeds with this because he's a great personality within photography. Yeah, so. I think he'll do quite well. I mean, I've seen his stuff a couple of times just when looking for specific camera makes and models and just how they run and um, pretty much like a YouTube manual of the camera. So it'll be interesting to see what he goes on to. Well, yeah, look, his first review on his own channel is is of the EOS M5 or the Canon EOS M5, the, the um, current generation mirrorless camera. <laughs> it's, it's funny because he's actually done uh, something that I did with the EOS M3, which is like pairing the biggest possible lens you could with the uh, Canon uh, 70 to 200 f 2.8 on it to kind of I turn it into a Franken camera. Like it looks, looks funny. It's like a little kind of handheld camera. Um, how would you say you know a little happy snap camera with this massive big lens on it just to just to be different um, <laughs> it's pretty entertaining to watch and, and like I, I really hope he actually succeeds on his own um, which I'm sure he will because he's, he's such a great talent he's already got 130,580 subscribers on his YouTube channel so um, yeah hopefully we, we see more of him something else um, so uh, a, a guy who's um, create or uh, used an iPhone 6s um, makes the finals of the Nat Geo photo competition. Yeah, I, I've had a few comments um, on my photos of people saying, "Ah, uh, the only reason you get these good photos is because you have really expensive cameras." And to see this, it's I guess this will be some a place I can direct people to if they ever say that again. Say, so, well, someone with an, a phone camera has yeah, made the finals for the Nat Geo photo competition. So it's not just about the expensive camera. It's about the, the vision that you have when creating the image and having a camera on you when the opportunity arises. Definitely. I think the current generation now of iPhones, and mate, 
I've, I've just actually got my hand on um, last week a couple of iPhone 7 Pluses so we can maybe chat about that next episode about what, about what I think of it because I haven't actually come up with a you know a full conclusion or answer to that yet um but like the current generation of mobile cameras being able to shoot raw plus being able to edit directly through some of the incredible mobile editing suites that are out there now um it's it's i think quite a broadened photography even more than so so than it was before you know i mean maybe to the average person they don't even need to carry a normal camera around now um so i think yeah, um, this is cool to see, kind of seeing somebody who's used a mobile phone actually um, succeeding. And even like the Apple, big Apple billboards now, you know, shot on iPhones. Well, they've got massive big billboards on the streets um, showing some incredible images that have been produced with them. It's, it's a pretty cool campaign to see. So knowing how to use a camera effectively <laughs> definitely goes towards um, helping. And I'm pretty sure there'd be a lot of, you know, some, some pretty talented photographers here in Australia who would be just um, just as successful if they really wanted to go down the path because they know all about light and kind of know how to use a camera in the first place. So, Do you think any of the celebrities that are being hired as photographers would get hired if they just use their mobile phone? Maybe. I don't know. Well, I mean, they're, they're pretty good at taking selfies, aren't they? <laughs> well, they definitely get a bit of exposure <laughs> from any photo they take. So it seems that um, companies are using that fact to just have that that name to get someone with that name to take a photo for a specific ad campaign and they seem to yeah be hiring celebrities as photographers so do you reckon do you reckon it's just because they're celebrities or do you reckon they celebrities can be photographers as well look i, I think this is interesting kind of seeing a rise in celebrities turning into photographers i i mean it's probably I don't know whether it's just all of a sudden become a newsworthy topic that people focus on or whether it's, you know, just always been the case. But I, I, I find it interesting maybe, I mean, one earlier this year was David Beckham's son who kind of shot a campaign for Burberry and there was a lot of talk about this, uh, whether he was chosen more so for his name than his photography talent. But at the same time, the images that he created were pretty awesome. So I think maybe Burberry got a double wear me out of this where they got great um, conversation around a campaign which obviously is marketing value um, plus they also got you know a, a great set of images from a guy who's clearly talented enough to shoot for that brand so just with that as well I mean Burberry is not going to hire just anyone and put a camera in their hand and tell them to shoot they, they're they still going to want decent shots of their product so it, it doesn't really matter if it's a celebrity or not and yeah as you said they got a double whammy from having a bit of exposure around the shoot itself which was good for their marketing but yeah just because a celebrity is a celebrity doesn't mean that they can't be a photographer as well i mean you don't see everything about their lives from the paparazzi or just in the press so they could learn how to take photos just the same as anyone else who works another job could (laughs) Definitely. I think some of the reports that I was reading about this maybe is more so focused on the jealousy of it. You know, oh, he's got a big name, so he probably doesn't need the work or, you know, he's he's got the name, so he's just automatically got the job. Well, yeah, I don't believe that either. I think um, obviously a brand has two points. Obviously, they want some great images of uh, that could tell a story around a campaign. But if you can also, as a brand, put yourself in their position um, that, you know, that instant marketing value of using a celebrity who is a photographer, not necessarily a celebrity photographer, but a celebrity who is a photographer, is going to give you um, instant <laughs> instant press coverage for that campaign. And I reckon the dollar for dollar marketing value in terms of selecting a photographer like that, who's clearly talented enough to do so anyway, um, would have definitely paid off for them in the long run. And you know, there's plenty of examples out there. And we'll put up an article to, to what we're talking about here. Be interested to know what our, what our listeners and community kind of think about this one. Um, there'd be a few pro photographers out there who'd be competing for this sort of role so it'd be interesting to kind of hear some feedback about what people think so i suppose yeah there is that competition and when someone else gets a job you think oh, like damn it i wanted that job and when it is a celebrity it's even more of a kicking the struggling workers while they're down just because yeah the celebrities probably don't need the work and the photographers that have been doing it for their whole lives survive on that kind of stuff yeah, no, definitely. I, you know, I, I can understand both points of view, um, but 
as a person who also works in, in maximizing engagement for brands as well, this one, I, I completely understand why they would make that decision. Um, and good on them. You know, it's their choice. And I, I bet you that campaign paid off well and truly even before the images went to print. And if you want to improve your photography, then uh, send your photos into our Project Rawcast hashtag and jump on board with our competition for our F-Stoppers tutorial competition. Yep. So keep those posts rolling in up until the 18th of December at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, um, and we'll we'll be we'll be announcing that on the Project Rawcast um, uh, Instagram Inst- Instagram account. Yes, that's the one. Um, yeah. No, I I almost forgot the name of it then. That's that's pretty weird. Um, and again, massive thank you to Nisi for the ongoing support. So five um, percent off to all of our listeners. Um, it's Christmas time, guys. So why not go out there and and make the most of that? So five percent off any purchase at nisifilters.com.au by using Project Rawcast as the coupon code during that. Um, now, Kieran, while we are um, planning our next episode, I'm going to go and try and take a shot that makes it into the centerfold of Australian Photography Magazine. All right. You, you may have to add a bit of an article or give something to the readers other than just taking a photo. Nope. <laughs> nope, no, just the photo. Just the photo. photo. All right. Just the photo. Set a fold. Uh, cool. Sweet. So, yeah. I All guess, right. so, yeah, a double, a double print or double page spread of a photo would be nice to have in a magazine as well. Well, mate, everybody gets a cover these days apparently, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yeah, cool. throwing them out left, right and centre. On that note, I'll talk to you later. All right. Catch you later. <laughs> See you, mate.